Okay, so we are live. So, hello. Hello. So, I'm here sitting with Ilana, who's a kid, an educator, and uh, somebody who pioneered a very special school, the Shefa School. Uh, so, Ilana, what don't we do you tell us about you a little bit to start there? Sure. So I grew up a block away at 88th and Broadway. Um, I myself am a product of Jewish day school, <clears throat> and really I feel like some of the best of Jewish, the Jewish community. And, um, but I was living and working in this Jewish community and watching that there was this huge void um, and watching kids who struggled and feeling that we could do better, feeling that I knew that we, when I was looking at this problem, which was around 2012, 2013, I was seeing that we know a lot now about sort of how to help kids who struggle with learning and that when kids are in the school that really understands them and a school that can really meet their needs where they are, that it's transformative both to the child and their sense of themselves and to the whole family system. Um, and that, you know, they say you're only as happy as your least happy child. And so often that's that that kid is often the least happy child. And these kids are amazing. And these kids are capable of learning and these kids are capable of succeeding. And these kids are capable of being great students, not just great in other things, but actually great students. Um, and I was seeing that in the secular world, they were doing amazing things. And I kept asking myself and asking everyone around me, how come we're not in this business? Um, and so I started to talk to people. And the more I talked to people, the more I was clear it wasn't just a good idea, but it was something that had to happen. And while I felt like in lots of ways I had no business doing this, I didn't have an expertise in lots of the things that I had to pull together, I knew that there were people around me who were experts. And that if I was smart enough to surround myself by people who were smart and people who knew what they were doing and had expertise, that we could take the best of what was happening in these secular special ed schools and bring them into the Jewish community and create a container where kids were both going to experience Jewish life and are going to be able to experience themselves as successful, experience their shefa, the name of the school, means abundance. And it came from a place of saying, these kids have abundant blessings and abundant gifts, and we need to remember that. We need to put that at the center of what we do with them and how we treat them so they don't have to feel um, outside. This uh, idea of repairing something that was missing mm -hmm. in the community came from a sense of something is missing, something has to be done, or also you had a personal connection with the issue of a disability, learning disability, or, or anything like that? It's an interesting question. The truth is, for me, school was always a place that was easy. Um, I always joke that if you can sit still and you can read, you can do very well in school. You don't have to be that smart, you don't have to be that nice, but if you can sit still and you can read, you do well, and I could do both those things very well. But I was always extremely aware of the kids around me who struggled. Um, I always say the way the teacher treated the least, the worst kid in the class is how they treated the whole class. And I remember from a very young age just feeling kind of shock and discomfort and pain as I watched kids being humiliated and kids being misunderstood and sort of would, on the outside sort of, I did a lot of like whispering into people's ears and tutoring on the phone and helping and just feeling like I didn't understand why teachers didn't have the imagination to try it a different way. Not just to say the same thing louder or again, but to think about what might help them. And I think for me, I went into education. I originally started in the inner city. I was sort of inspired by the work that was going on in East Harlem. And I think for me, education was always about sort of repair of the world it was always about sort of how do you help people who are underserved people who are forgotten um, and in some so for me certainly working in a community that was you know had less resources than the community that I had lived in was very meaningful and I think this was sort of a full circle of that of sort of saying this is within my community a group of kids who had been kind of forgotten um, and ignored and so for me that's very much always been my sort of motivation of why I've why I do this work? For me, this is a, a personal issue mm -hmm. since I am dyslexic and you are dyslexic, you're dyslexic always. For life. For life. And uh, grammar doesn't make, I speak three languages. Grammar doesn't make any sense in any other three languages. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank God for all these things that spell checks and still I make mistakes. But the the elementary school experience was traumatic. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I don't use this word lightly, 
the issue of humiliation was constant. And uh, I remember, I mean, I remember the ignorance of my teachers and also the ignorance of my parents. They didn't know that such a thing existed. They thought I was lazy and I was not paying attention and I want just to be playing. And so they didn't connect the dots. And I really discovered that I was dyslexic by chance in college when I studied psychology and they were doing a test on me and <laughs> a teacher told me, you know, that you're dyslexic. I said, what is that? So it was very traumatic. And uh, unfortunately, there were a few teachers who, uh, they were sadist in the way they treated me and us. And there were other teachers who, I would say, out of a sense of compassion and out of a sense of capturing that intelligence was something more than the difficulty that I did, that I had, they rescued me. So I felt also rescued by some amazing teachers. My, my question to you is somebody like me would go, would have gone to a Shefa school, you know, within the Jewish community, the Christian community, secular community, but, a, but a, a place where these kids could be understood. In which way would have been different? Look, I think the first thing that happens is there's a journey that families go through before they their child comes to the Shefa school because what happens is people, nobody gets, you know, parenting is the hardest job we all have and nobody gets a manual. And so your child arrives and you don't, you're confused. You don't understand. You think they're lazy. You think they should try harder. You think if there's something wrong with the teacher, there's something wrong with, there's gotta be someone to blame for the fact that your child is not doing the thing that the child right next to them is doing with ease. And your brains wire differently. That's why it's harder. Some things are easier, some things are harder. And I think that often when we talk to families as they've come to a, that place of discovery after doing some testing and often years of trauma and drama and pain, um, they often are worried about telling their child about their diagnosis and they're often surprised at how good it feels for that child to have a name for it. And that the truth of it is actually doesn't make them feel worse, it makes them feel better. It makes them feel like, oh, I have an explanation. I have yeah, a reason. Now I understand. Now yeah. I understand there's nothing wrong with me. And I think that that's a very, just in and of itself, that experience is tremendously healing for lots of kids and families when they start to say, okay. And then there's a roadmap. Um, you know, one of the great things about this time is now there's a really a roadmap. You know, the fact that you didn't hadn't heard that word is an amazing thing. I don't think that could happen anymore in your situation. That they would never have. This, may, maybe they probably they would have diagnosed it, but certainly you would have heard of it. Yeah. But I think that the other thing that happens is that we sort of create an environment where the child can be successful. So first of all, the class size is smaller. The teachers are all trained in working with students like who have dyslexia and who have learning disabilities. They're able to meet, you know, kids don't, nobody learns unless they feel safe. And the goal really for us is creating a sense of safety and saying, and starting to believe that the teacher's only gonna ask something that they're capable of. Hmm. And that often takes a reprogramming. You know, often in the beginning of the year, parents say the homework is so easy and we're like, we're gonna make this homework really easy for a while because we want kids to believe that they can go home Take out that piece of paper and do it on their own. They're so, you know, when we in the beginning of the year say it's reading time, all the kids run to the nurse in the bathroom. They're traumatized. That was a time when they were being asked to do something they just couldn't do. And so part of it is that retraining and that developing of a relationship, real relationship with teachers who see them and who know them and who know that they're smart and know that they have work to do. In other words, our goal is not just to say, don't worry, honey, you're terrific. Our goal is to say, don't worry, honey, and we're going to give you the skills that you do need. Because we really do believe that being able to be a reader and a writer and a student are things that are gifts to kids. And that they can do it. And so it's not just, okay, we're going to put on an audio tape and you'll never have to read a book again. We want kids to be able to have the magic of opening a book. Um, but that the teachers are going to always push them just that right amount where we're going to stay with you. It's okay to make a mistake. You know, we very quickly, when kids will read and they make a mistake, the teacher immediately corrects them. There's no tone, there's no anger. It's like, we're, that, wasn't, that doesn't say that word. It says something else and we're gonna tell you what that word says and we're gonna give you more practice. And that that building of both feeling safe to take risks and make mistakes and being able to feel that we're gonna give it to you. You know, if, you're, if you have a language-based learning disability, you need everything in like little 
little itsy bitsy increments to be able to learn the same thing that someone else just picked up through osmosis through reading hearing their child parents read them books and seeing signs on the streets some kids learn how to read that way but these kids don't and so being able to give them very small bite-sized things where they can feel successful and then that what also happens is success and com competence breeds confidence and confidence breeds competence and so that cycle starts to shift and then everything's possible you know, we're talking about a huge universe, you know, we're talking about learning disabilities, mm -hmm. dyslexia, even there are different types of. Uh, for me, one of the uh, m most clear explanations that somebody gave me, somebody told me, a teacher told me, you just, you're wired differently. Mm -hmm. your, 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 your wires go in a different yeah. channels. So we have to know how they go and that's it. Uh, but is there a formula? I mean, is there a formula for a kid who doesn't know how to read or, or reverse the, the letters or the numbers, you know, still cannot be trusted with numbers. So how do you teach that? What's the what's the way if you if you if you open this up and you enter into that universe also for parents, so how what does it mean that the wires are different? So the thing that's Practically. amazing is there is now science, there are now pictures of brains that show that your wires are different. That's exactly, that they're actually the pathway for when you read. When, if they're dyslexic, when they read, they have a different path. And it's a less efficient path and it's more difficult. And so part of what we, we say to our, to our students is, you know, with neuroplasticity, that we are actually going to build that pathway. And we say it's like building a road. It's going to take a lot of practice. It's going to take a lot of hard work to build a new road. But we are actually going to build a new road. And the science shows that with interventions like what we do at Shafa, they actually start to see the brain change. Um, so it's basically neuroplasticity. You are, neuroplasticity means that we are really creating the brain as we give new input and new ways of doing things. We are actually creating uh, new associations and the brain reproduces itself and the cells. So we are really kind of rewiring. You're ways. literally making new roads, new pathways. But the yes. other thing that's also really important is often these kinds of kids also have tremendous strengths and have yeah, all kinds absolutely. of intelligences. Absolutely. So the other thing is, it's like, yes, you just have to do, eat your broccoli, do the hard work of practicing over and over and over again. I'm going to teach you the long A. I'm going to teach you the short A. I'm going to teach you what happens when we add an E to the end of the word, all of it, one by one by one, those rules. But we're also going to remember that you have a lot of capacity. And so when we're talking about social studies or we're talking about Judaic studies or we're looking at science or we're having a conversation about your weekend, we're going to also talk at your thinking level, not at your reading level. Because often what happens to these kinds of kids is because they don't have access when the teacher says open up to page 72 in your textbook, you never get to hear about the magic of the American Revolution or understand what's really going on between you know, biblical figures that where there's depth and richness. <coughs> and so part of what we're also always thinking about is how do you meet that curiosity, that higher yeah. order thinking at the same time, while also trying over time, we want you to be able to read that textbook on page 72. But in the meantime, I don't want you to miss out and know that the world is an amazing and interesting place. And often what happens is kids start to shut down and or just not have access, even if they've tried yeah. to be able to do all that other. So then they also, it's another, dis it's another thing that keeps them distant because they can't have that conversation. Yeah. Because they don't know what happened in the American yeah. Revolution or why Abraham took a journey, because they missed it. Yeah. So let's go back a little bit to the, to the comfort that gives a kid, mm -hmm. uh, or like me as a teenager, to understand, okay, whatever I have has an explanation, which is the, the danger of diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So I have kids, I always, you know, I, I, I work with kids with disabilities. I created a special Abdallah, special services. I do bar mitzvahs for kids with Down syndrome, with autism, and all the kids with dyslexia, I just put it out there and dyslexia, so come to talk to me. At the same time, as I said that, I have kids who have come to talk to me, and they have all the, the DSM-4 manual of diagnosis yep. in their hand. You know what, I take Ritalin, I have this, I have that, I, 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 I give me all that. And I say, you know what, I understand all that, but you don't tell me that this is you. Mm -hmm. Okay, these labels, I understand, but at the same time, this, is a, this could be a way to cop out, you know, to say, okay, I cannot do it because yeah. I have these labels. You know, these labels protect me from really even trying. So, 
I have problems with this. I have problems with the non-diagnosis yes. and with the over-diagnosis. That could be a way for the kids really not to try something, not to even go into the road of neuroplasticity. Yeah, so I would say a few things. First of all, we really try to emphasize that it's not that they can't. When we use, we use the word learning disability, which is a very controversial term, and I some know, people don't I like know. disability. Our view is it is harder, and we're going to say it like it is. It's harder. Doesn't mean you can't do it, though. And, and it means you're going to have to work harder. And we talk also in our school, we talk to kids about grit and perseverance, and we try to really help them understand that, that those are the qualities that are going to serve them. Yes. And every morning, I feel like I'm a better person because I get to watch these students who are the grittiest kids alive. They're working harder to do everything. Yeah. And to me, that's gonna serve them. And we often, you know, I recently, we, our eighth graders are all applying to, our school ends in eighth grade, so they all have to go into high schools, and we do these mock interviews with them. Uh, because they're gonna go to high schools and they're gonna ask them questions. And I always say, so tell me about a time when you've had a challenge. You know, these kids have an answer to that question. Yeah. And I always reflect back and I say, when I'm hiring, I want people who've had challenges and who know how to face them. I don't want someone who says, I've never had a challenge and everything's always perfect for me. And so how do we help them see it as a source of their strength? And how can they come back to it when they're facing a different challenge, whether it's a learning challenge or a challenge in their job, their marriage, their health, that they know that they know how to face things that are hard and to see it as a sign of that that's what makes them great. Yeah, I, I mean, it, after many years of therapy, of course, uh, I came to to realize and to almost be grateful for what I had because it gave me a different uh, parabolic antenna about the world and especially about suffering. Yeah. It's like I understand suffering from the inside. It's, uh, it's, it, it gives you uh, ways of understanding reality that maybe without this I would have, would have had. So in many ways also becomes, if you survive, That's right. it becomes a blessing. Well, you said something else, which is also that one of the things you had growing up is you had some people who saw you yes. and who appreciated your strengths and who you were. Yes. And I think that's also core, is you're going to have more adversity, you're going to have that kid who's going to say something nasty, and we can't make a perfect world for these kids where nobody's ever going to say something stupid that's going to hurt their feelings. But yes. But if they have some people in their lives who can appreciate who they are, I think that's tremendously powerful. Ilana, I, I call this conversation mindfulness and learning disabilities. You know, we just came back. Uh, Ilana was in the retreat that Karina, Sol, and myself led in Montaña Sur in Costa Rica. It was beautiful. Amazing. And the, the whole idea of mindfulness is to, to pay attention in a non-judgmental way and to be able to separate ourselves from a stimuli and response and to be able to choose how do we show up in the world. So I'm giving a, a very long story short here. Mm -hmm. So how, if we, would, if we would find the connection between mindfulness and this work, what do you, would you say? In which way one contributes with the other? So in lots of ways, I mean, we, we actually work on mindfulness in our school with our students. Many of our students, so this is a, there are lots of answers to this question, but this is the first that comes up, is many of our students also struggle with ADHD. There's a very high correlation between, between kids with learning disabilities and kids with ADHD. And I think more and more in our society, we just see it more and more. And we work with our kids on it. And part of it is that we find that being able to get quiet, that's the work, right? Is how to get quiet enough to be available to learn to be available to persevere, to be available to acknowledge what they can change and what's harder for them, to be able to acknowledge the ways in which they're different than their siblings. They might have wished it was some other way, but they're you know, blessings to where they are. Um, and so we, really, we, act, we teach it to the students and we use it often as a tool just to bring them back. Um, and we're, it's very powerful that you know, we, the kids have reading for 80 minutes first thing in the morning. That's a long time for anyone. Yeah. Nevertheless, for these kids. And first of all, they can do it over time, they really build a capacity. But we'll find that sometimes, somewhere in the middle of that time, if you just, you know, take a minute, take a few deep breaths, take a, take a, a chance for kids to be able to ground themselves and center themselves, it's tremendously powerful. I also use it with our staff when we have a staff meeting often mm -hmm. before the meeting, we'll, we'll also just sit because everyone comes in racing from the day. Um, 
And I think to be able to do hard things, we need to be able to find our core, to find yeah. our center. And, yeah. and for families and for kids, both just being able to be where, where we are. This is where we are right now. Yeah. For me, I think it would have been incredible, as you said, to be able to sit, to be able to pay attention, and to be able to pay attention to the rest of my life that was not this. Mm-hmm. But this also informed me. And made me a sensitive human being so I think mindfulness is a way also to put the lens in different aspects of of the human being of a person and to be able to see listen this is just one aspect and the only thing that does is okay you have to work harder but at the same time you know it's very difficult for a kid to to see in the future there are going to be benefits that come from this work because there are benefits Mm -hmm. that come from this work but uh, but to be able to just to pay attention even to the anxiety to lower the anxiety to take a deep breath and to see the big picture that could be that would have been also for me yeah they're also i mean I don't, i'd be curious how you think they're connected but it feels to me like one of the things we also build is um kids sense of metacognition understanding how they think how they work what their process is what they need that all of those things like sort of we try to fill their toolboxes so that when they go out into the world, whatever that means, that they're aware of the things, that the strategies that they may always need that will help them. And I think that sort of mindfulness is also about being able to kind of pull back a little bit and watch yourself thinking, watch yourself in silence, watching what are the places that, what comes up. And I guess, I, I don't know whether you see a connection between it, but it feels related to me. No, of course, absolutely it feels related to me. I, I, I wanted just to go in another direction just to, to end, using your experience, uh, what would you say was your most important message to the parents who are dealing with a kid with who is having these difficulties? I don't want to go into the different myriad of difficulties, but learning disabilities. I think our work as parents is to be that person who recognizes their kids as they are. To be able to always hold on to that there's gonna we're gonna yes have to look and address the places that are deficient the places that are hard but that our role as a parent is to sort of see also our children's wholeness and if we can hold on to that despite the noise and despite the diagnoses and despite the tutors to be able to hold on to what makes that child perfect in their imperfection just sort of in the image of God um, that that's the greatest gift we can give our kids yeah, to look to arrow, actually see them, to so actually see them. Yeah, thank you. So I'm going to turn this off, and uh, people also can follow me in different mindfulness practices. Thank you so much, Ilana. My pleasure.